Welcome, everybody. Uh, Mike Anony is here today to chat with us about um, press freedom and network journalism. Mike is a postdoc at Microsoft Research um, until late June, a fellow at the Berkman Center, and he will be joining the University of Southern California um, in August as an assistant professor. So welcome, Mike. Thanks. Thanks, everyone. Uh, I'm going to stand if it's a little easier so I can actually see everybody um, when I'm talking. Um, but yeah. Thanks very much for the invitation to talk today. Um, what I wanted to do is actually describe a project that I've been working on for a couple of years. And it's around this idea of what press freedom might mean in an era of network journalism. So a quick way to think about this is there's a, you know, a very different landscape of production of speech online, especially. Um, so one of the starting points is, is there a meaning of press freedom that we can think about being present in all of the journalistic network practices. And what, what might press freedom mean in this sense? Is there a difference between the speech clause and the press clause today? Is there a different identity for the press um, as distinct from uh, people who are speaking online? So what I want to do is ask you to just hold on to those ideas a little bit, is this idea of press freedom, this idea of network journalism, and walk with me through this idea of what it might mean. So just to set the context a little bit, and I'm sorry, maybe a little hard to see with the, with the lights, but um, I mean, this is not surprising or new to anybody in this room, but just this idea that these are stats from the Pew Center for um, uh, State of the Media report. Basically, online is just dominating the growth of news, right? We see generally a decline in newspapers. Many other sources are flatlined, and online is the place where we, we see this growing. It's something I think we all sort of know intuitively, um, but there's, there's stats on it. The other thing I wanted to start with in terms of context is sort of there's a lot of talk or, or uh, consternation right now about the meaning of social media and news. And at least what, what Pew found recently is that social media is not yet a huge driver of traffic to news sites. We see most people going directly to news websites or their apps, uh, finding stories or finding news sites through search. Um, or through um, websites that are particularly created by news organizations. So with, with at least through Facebook and Twitter as being a relatively small amount of traffic. Yes? If we can't read the legend of that, oh, can I'm, you tell us what it says? I'm sorry. Yeah, sure. Um, so basically we have about uh, a little over a third of people going directly to news websites. It's just sort of showing where does traffic to news websites come from. And we see a really small set of them coming through Twitter and Facebook recommendations. That's the only takeaway from that. So don't worry about the, the details on, okay. on that. Okay. No, it's a good question, though. And then if we do dive into social media a little bit, we actually see that friends and family, especially on Facebook, are a dominant source of uh, referrals to news sites. So actually with journalists and news organizations playing a relatively small role right now on Facebook. So again, the details of this is not super important, but what I just want you to take away is this idea that we have this confluence of different actors. We have news organizations, social media companies, friends and family social relations, uh, search companies that are driving traffic. And there's, a, there's sort of a big mess here, a big mix of trying to understand how news traffic flows. So that's one piece of context that I just want you to keep in mind. The other piece of context I want you to keep in mind is a story. And again, don't don't pay attention to the details too much. It's this dip that, in the graph that I think you can see that's the main point. There was a case that happened in 2008 where if you went to the Google News search engine and typed United Airlines, the first hit that you got back was a story about United Airlines filing for bankruptcy in 2008. Only problem was that that was a story from 2002. United Airlines filed for bankruptcy in 2002, not 2008. Google really quickly corrected the error, and it actually has a really nice review of how where that error came about. And it was basically to do with the search engine crawling the Sun Sentinel, um, which posted the story from 2002. The Sun Sentinel posting a story in a way that was just difficult for the news crawler to parse up and parse to know. So Google had a really nice response, and it was the, sort of this learning moment where we saw what was the interaction between a news crawler and the uh, stories that were posted on a website, but not before the United. Uh, stock price took a rather large tumble, um, and it you know gradually recovered. But there was sort of this moment where yeah, again confluence of actors. Sun Sentinel published the story a long time ago, posted on their website. Google News crawler crawling that site, making some sophisticated but in this case ill-informed guesses about what constituted timeliness, and then some real-world material consequences in terms of the United. Um, stock price. And the last one, uh, last piece of context that I want to provide, this is actually a, a set of cases that people in this room from the, uh, the Digital Media Law Project 
uh, worked on. There was a case where Enterline actually sued the Pocono Medical Center in Pennsylvania uh, for a sexual harassment case. Turns out the Pocono Record had written a story on that case, and Enterline decided they wanted to actually gain access to the commenters who had written under the story. So not the actual story itself, but people had written in the comments, and because they thought there was valuable information, and they wanted to know from the Pocono Record who are these commenters, uh, they wanted to contact them directly. Um, and this is a, a state-level decision, but the state basically found and said, no, the Pocono Record did not have to reveal the identity of those commenters. The, the logic is a little bit narrow in terms of it said that information was available other places anyway. But the end result was this sort of finding, at this, again, at the state level, that the press can actually protect the anonymous commenters of people who are posting under its site. So we start to see this sort of broadening of what's considered maybe a reporter's privilege or shield law at a state level to include comments underneath a story. We find the exact opposite finding where the Illinois, uh, state of Illinois impaneled a grand jury that actually um, subpoenaed comments from the Alton Telegraph around a case where they basically wanted to know, the again, the identity of the IP addresses, the names, uh, the dates, the times, when the commenters had posted stories, uh, posted comments underneath a particular story that the Telegraph had run, but we actually found the exact opposite. Uh, ruling in this case that said commenters are not considered sources, it's not considered under this umbrella of what we consider the press or journalism to be, and there is no protection. So I offer these three starting points, this, this broad notion of what kind of stats we're dealing with in terms of social media and, and Facebook and Twitter and how news traffic is flowing, and also this case of a uh, search engine crawler interacting with a news story, making some sophisticated guesses about what constitutes timeliness, and then the court's decision about what constitutes a news story. And what I want to argue is that these are all, in a way, stories of press freedom. These are all stories about moments when the press, in, its, in a rather traditional form, is interacting with some new actors, and we have some confusion about what constitutes journalism, what doesn't constitute journalism. And these are socio, what I want, want to argue is that these are socio-technical moments. If we want to understand what press freedom means in each of these cases and some others I'm going to get to, we have to understand how code is generated, how it's understood, but also how the professional practices of the press are understanding their relationship to different technologies. And what I, what I, the main point I want to leave you with is this idea that press freedom actually lives in what I call this network materiality. So it lives in this space where people are coming together and then a lot of our old assumptions about what constitutes journalism or press need to be updated in terms of this. But if I want to back up just a minute, I actually want to argue something uh, slightly different to start with, and that's as soon as you use words like press freedom or press autonomy, it kind of begs some questions about what do you mean by freedom, right? And I think uh, in this country especially, we've seen sort of this dominance of free market logics as constituting what free speech means. So this idea you send out information into the marketplace of ideas, somehow the marketplace sorts it out, truth emerges, it does this democratic work, and people are able to make decisions about how to be citizens. That's sort of the general model. But what I want to argue, actually, and there's this thread of both uh, legal theory, but also sort of philosophical theory around what freedom means. In, in a democracy, autonomy actually means more than freedom from something, right? It means more than my right not to be interfered with by you. It means something actually positive. There's an affirmative notion such that for me to actually have autonomy, for me to realize myself, for me to do these things, discover truths, direct my own actions, understand consequences, understand what it means to participate in a public sphere, I actually need you all to do something as well. It's, I, I need you to participate. I need you to actually say things that I can hear. So there's a, there's a sort of, this is the basis of a social contract that is the underpinning of what we mean by democratic freedom. So it means... What I assert here and what I can what I argue is that freedom requires more than hearing just what markets or self-interest or your friends, and I put in brackets here, or algorithms, might tell you. There might be a different conception of what constitutes freedom that can underpin what we mean by press autonomy or press freedom. So that's, especially in a U.S. context, sometimes that's a bit of a, a radical departure from this idea that we're all individuals floating around completely uh, formed without the need to actually interact and depend upon others, but we actually think that that's a, a different thing. So the second premise of this argument is to say that a free press, it's actually part of this system of freedom of expression, right? If the press is not something that just happens to have been 
uh, constructed through a bunch of different voices speaking, but maybe, and this is the open question of this project, maybe there's something that the press does that's in, that entails or engenders this freedom, uh, this positive freedom that I was mentioning earlier. So this is the starting point, is to think about the press freedom as something that's about the press separating itself from others, about saying, no, this is a moment where we are the press. We can think about the issue of the comments uh, under the news stories as a moment where the press said, we're going to carve this out as a reporter's privilege area. This is, the, this is a press function. But we also have these moments where the press depends upon different institutions. The press depends upon search engines and Facebook and different institutions to drive traffic through it. So the press cannot be this completely separate institution. The press has to be in this constant negotiation of what it means to both be the press and not be the press. So this is the base. This is a rather, again, sort of inflammatory quote for sometimes when I give this talk in the US. But Alexander Mickeljohn was sort of one of the early theorists of this idea um, in, a, in a, a legal philosophical thought. And what he said is that in talking about the press as an institution of free speech, he said, the point of ultimate interest here is not the words of the speakers, but the minds of the hearers. The press ensures not that everyone shall speak, but that everything worth saying shall be said. And this should raise some flags here because it should say, well, how do we know what it means for everything worth saying shall be said? What are the criteria by which that's going to be judged? And what are the structural conditions that might entail that things that are being said or worth hearing are being said and that we're all having a likelihood of encountering them? So that's, that's sort of the starting point is saying these are, these are not easy questions and I, I don't mean this in terms of government censorship or in terms of preventing people from speaking. I actually mean the opposite. I mean the likelihood that you're going to encounter ideas that are different from your own that you haven't sought out to, to hear. Which brings me to this idea that press freedom is this problem of networked institutionalism. So I want to give a brief history of US press freedom. Um, it's always dangerous to do this on one slide, but what I want to argue actually here is that this problem is not new, right? This idea of the press having to separate itself from other people, the press having to carve out moments when it's unique, but also the press having to depend upon other people to, uh, to perform its actions and actually achieve its goals, this is not really a new problem. And we see it again, um, so the Supreme Court actually, it's almost, it actually is kind of easy to summarize the Supreme Court's view on the press clause um, in one slide because the Supreme Court has actually really shied away from making decisions based on press clause logic. Okay, we don't actually see a huge case law history here. We see a lot of invocations of speech clause and a lot of talk about what constitutes free speech, but the, the court in this country, the Supreme Court in this country at least, has tended to shy away from defining what the press is. And this makes sense in a way. We don't want to have sort of a two-tiered constitution where we say, if you are a member of the press and you, you have a press pass or you're employed by a news organization, we actually, we kind of don't want to create a situation where those people have more freedoms than somebody else because that's, that's a, it's a dangerous moment when the constitution starts being uh, fragmented in a way. So the, the court has tended to do it and we found that um, in its findings, so there's no federal shield law, for instance. There's no right of reporter's privilege to, you know, not be compelled to testify in front of a grand jury uh, at a federal level. There are at state levels, but not at a federal level. Um, for a time, there was this right of uh, reply and this notion of a fairness doctrine uh, at a federal court, and we see that through cases like Red Lion or, or um, uh, Miami Herald versus Tornillo, but it was a, a slightly different finding. But we saw that actually sort of slowly erode, especially in the 80s through a lot of FCC decision making, such that today we don't really have that same kind of logic. But for a time in sort of the 60s and 70s, this was this notion of uh, fairness doctrine applied. But again, we saw the court sort of shying away from this idea of press freedom. Another set of histories really here to talk about press freedom is actually more in the sociology of the profession of the press itself. And what we've seen, especially in this country since sort of the 1920s, is this idea that journalism has really struggled with whether, whether it's uh, what James Carey calls an interpretive profession or whether it's called a scientized or objective profession. Are they, is the press about going out and telling and reporting the truth and the objective news, or is it about making interpretations? And that's, that's sort of an age-old debate in journalism, but we see the press constantly struggling with that. Um, for instance, Daniel Hallen calls this the scientized view of journalism, where journalists have this sort of physics envy, where they want to go out into the world and report on experiments and, and claim a truth value of what they've done. And that's traditionally not really worked very well for <clears throat> a host of reasons about the social construction of knowledge. 
But we also see in the history of journalism this idea of rise of professional organizations, schools. We see schools of journalism starting to arise in sort of the 1920s and 30s, which are different from schools of speech communication and different from schools of English, where journalists are starting to rely upon sort of tricks of the trade, including using polling data for the first time in sort of the 1930s as a way of distancing itself from publics and saying, it's not me that's reporting this story, it's the poll that's reporting this story. This is not me as a journalist entering into and having a relationship with my source is this is me relying upon statistical data. So again, we see this sort of this dance between journalists and the world as they're separating themselves. And one of my, my last sort of um, examples here is a neat one. There's a bunch of really great studies showing that even journalists in their use of language within stories do these very subtle um, sort of interpretations of the sources and of the events that they're reporting on. We see use of irony actually in a lot of journalist stories. So. Um, they will sort of report, there's a great case of uh, Lou Cannon reporting upon uh, Reagan went to South Africa and uh, suddenly in the 80s and said there was no such thing as apartheid. And was sort of, you know, and, and Lou Cannon, ha you know, this is the words of the president, you have to report on this in some way, but Lou Cannon as a journalist knows that there is apartheid there. How do you possibly do that? So he frames these whole stories in this ironic fashion saying, well, I guess Reagan thinks there's no apartheid. And it's, it's thick, the language is thick with irony in these moments. And we also see journalists using even adverbial phrases. So obviously, or suddenly, or actually, or these little moments of sort of using language to signal to the interested reader that, you know, wink, wink, I really have an idea of what's going on here. I'm not an objective reporter. So we see the press sort of doing that, lots of moments. And finally, the last thing we see is these sort of organizational routines in the press. So we see these ways of news organizations uh, organizing a beat structure. So you always go to you know, the city hall, the fire department, the uh, police department. You always go to White House. You always go to Congress. This is where stories happen, and we see the news organization structuring itself in a way that it can reliably interact with these places, that's where news happens. So the, we don't see the press necessarily in the history sort of creating new beats all of a sudden. So for, there's, you know, there's a automobile section and a real estate section to most newspapers. There's often no labor section to a newspaper. You know, why? Why not? Um, this is a, a moment when reporters do this. Um, another kind of neat finding in the history of journalism here is that we often find when you ask reporters um, there's this ideal, you know, oh, you must write for the public and you must have this public service and this public interest. And a lot of them re reliably say, are you kidding me? That's incredibly nerve wracking. I don't want to write for an, like, an undifferentiated public. I write for my friends and my family and my editors. So in sort of the press's negotiation of its relationship with the public, we, we see this incredible, incredible personalization of, of journalism such that actually even when um, the idiom of insanity there, you can see even when news... Uh, organization professionals talk about, what do you think of the people who write in on your stories? What do you think of the commenters or the letters to the editor? A lot of them report, those people are crazy. I don't want anything to do with them. I don't ask me to engage with them. I just, I, I want to go do my stuff and I actually don't want to be touched by this public. So I offer these sort of as a, as a little bit of a landscape of saying that this idea of press freedom is, is constant negotiation of reporters and journalists separating themselves from public in a number of different ways, but also simultaneously relying upon the public both for, um, for sort of cultural and monetary value. So what I want to say today, so if, if, if that's sort of, you know, the end of, of part two in a sense, today I think we're actually seeing this notion of press freedom being worked out in a bunch of new sites. And what I want to do is rather quickly go through some examples to give you a sense of where I'm seeing press freedom being worked out. These are again these locations, these tensions where this separation and dependency between the press and others is being worked out. And the first one is just, you know, quite, quite honestly, sort of press economics, where we see online revenue being a fraction of print revenue. So there's this idea of trying to create a revenue stream that can support quality journalism, this unstable relationship to aggregators trying to figure out either whether it's with uh, Google News or, or Yahoo News or um, different kinds of aggregators or Facebook or Twitter, trying to figure out what it means to exist in relation to these aggregators. Uh, philanthropic funding being increasingly a, a source. The LA Times just uh, received a large grant to fund its reporting. And uh, finally, some calls for state sponsorship or taxing uh, spectrum allocation. So there's this moment where the press is really, I think, uh, quite creatively and quite robustly now trying to figure out how it recreates its economic footing. Um, but we also see these, this, 
idea of press freedom, or again, this distinction, this difference and separation um, in the form of user generated content. I mean, CNNI report is an old uh, sort of example and a, a well trodden one where we see this branding of content. Sometimes it's CNN content, sometimes it's I report content, sometimes content flows from one side to another side, but that's an editorial decision. Those are moments, little moments when the press says, you as public, we're going to invite you into our branding or our moment. Um, we see it also in terms of commenting systems, a, a wide, I think, variety and a diverse set of commenting systems. The Huffington Post has a badging system so you can, you can become uh, a more well-respected commenter on the Huffington Post. You can be, again, invited in through a gradation of systems where the more you perform and the better you are as a commenter, you can um, be promoted through the Huffington Post's levels. Um, New York Times has a similar verified commenter uh, label that you can get. So you can be uh, moderated far less heavily if you sort of pass the New York Times' test to, to be a verified commenter. Um, that test, curiously, relies upon confirming your identity through Facebook. So that's one of the things. So again, we see this moment where um, you know, your, your participation in the system of the New York Times, and I understand why the Times is doing it. It's actually not a criticism at all. There's this ideal, this need to from the Times perspective to verify identity. But again, here's this moment where we're relying upon a third party to do that. So we have to ask about constituency. And finally, just the, uh, the last one here is this Washington Post, the, it, one of the examples of a social reader that have sort of uh, tanked a lot in terms of usage patterns in the last sort of month or two. Um, but again, this moment where the Post says, you wanna read this story, go through the Facebook app that is going to count it for us and I think, um, many of us probably had that moment where we were like, oh man, really? I just wanted to read that story. I didn't want to actually enter into this rather complex relationship um, with it. But that's sort of, again, this moment where we see this press freedom being, being negotiated. No, I mean, it's a, it's a, and I think that's actually why you see, you've seen this dramatic drop off in the usage of that. You know, another sort of reading participation is this idea of crowdsourced funding. Uh, I think a lot of people in this room probably know David Cohen, this spot.us, this idea of crowdsourcing funding for a story. So you put up a story, say, ah, it's gonna cost me 400 bucks to do this story. Who wants to add a little bit, sort of Kickstarter for news in a way. So people add, you know, 20 bucks and then gradually it gets to the th this threshold. A student of mine at Stanford, uh, got one of a, her stories funded for the Times, the giant pool of garbage that people saw. That was sort of a, a story that was popular in the Times a few years ago. She got it funded through Spot.us. And it's this, again, this moment of sort of, you know, relying upon or interacting with publics. A different version of that is AOL Seed, which is currently undergoing a little bit of revision. So it's not, it's not exactly this story right now because they're rejigging re it. Um, but it was basically the system that would go out and pay attention to search queries and say, what are popular search queries that are happening right now? And then AOL had a pool of stringers that it could rely upon and say, hey, it seems like we need some stories or some content around this particular topic because it seems to be really hot on a search engine. So again, this is a, you know, uh, journalism by demand almost that's generating stories based on search engine traffic. And I think we, we similarly see this in terms of professional practices. There's this, another source of pressure here on this idea of press freedom where journalists report actually saying they feel like they're under pressure to produce stories faster. They feel like they're under pressure to have a viewpoint within their stories more than they had felt before and to engage with their readers directly. So this is a moment where we're asking journalists again to not just go out and do, you know, Daniel Howland's 1920s, 30s scientized view of journalism as going out and discovering news and reporting news in an objective way, but we're actually asking them to be more like conveners of conversations. We're asking them to do more than we've asked them to do before. And that's, um, yeah. Isn't there also a trend for data Data directed journalism where you yeah. know, where people are actually relying on large data sets absolutely i 'm going to get to that later, okay. but yeah, no good excellent point um, so um, again, just another one here we see is this social media being used it 's this I, I did a little study on social media policies and social media usage within newsrooms, and we see this sort of real confusion right now about what journalists should do uh, with their social media accounts, whether they 're journalists firsts first or uh, independent social media users, second, what that overflow looks like, who gets a story first, does their news organization get it first, do they get it first, how do you source online if you don't, you can't verify the identity. Um, we see a sort of a, a confusion happening there. And similarly, we see this explosion of new roles even in terms of news organizations where we the old ombudsman, ombudsman um, role is being sort of recreated and reproduced with a bunch of new roles, whether it's social media editor, engagement editor. Again, this sort of this moment of struggle with news organizations, I think, trying to figure out what this means. And uh, second to last, we see this, again, another site I think we see 
this negotiation of press freedom happening is in some of the intellectual property and the organizational systems that news organizations are starting to create. So the uh, Associated Press's AP3P system is one of the ones that's gotten sort of the, the most attention lately, but essentially this idea of trying to create a little digital watermark within AP stories that you can then track stories as they flow across the web and have it be kind of like a content management system such that the AP can both track but also um, uh, shut down uses of its content in different places. So again, we see the AP responding and saying, we know our content's going to get out there. We're going to try a sort of a technological solution that's going to encode some you know, rather stringent views on IP that we have within our system, and we're going to create this watermark system. This is a, a little um, document that actually the, the Neiman Lab circulated from an internal AP confidential memo describing the system and the, the goals. Uh, I didn't take it. You can blame, blame the Neiman folks for that or thank the Neiman folks for that um, either way. Um, the Guardian, similarly, again, in this, in this theme, is doing a really cool thing with their open news list system. So they're actually saying those old processes where stories would get assigned within news organizations in a rather opaque way where we didn't necessarily know why one reporter was working on something or not or how many stories they were working on, the Guardian basically just publish, publishes a, a Google Doc that says who's working on what story, where it is in the particular state of development, so that you as reader or anyone can go and sort of see this internal baking of news that's happening in The Guardian. This, again, you know, I, it, a lot of these are real double-edged swords, right? Because, again, this is this moment where The Guardian's saying, come on in, public. We're going to show you, you know, how the sausage gets made. We're going to invite you in and see the stories that we're producing. Um, but at the same time, this can be an incredible starting point for uh, influencing a particular journalist who might be working on a story. If you are a source within it or you want to be a source within it, you now have an incredible avenue in, potentially, to figuring that out. So we're asking journalists now to you know, be open and be public and be different kinds of ethical figures as they're producing their stories. Um, and finally, we see this sort of notion of what I call this distributed human machine intelligence, where these are these moments, especially, and this is, I think, sort of the most exciting place, and it gets to, to that gentleman's question, is these are places where data and human decision making are interacting to produce journalism and to produce news, but it's, it's very, very unclear what press freedom means in this context. So authority from aggregation, Google News being a standard example, Technorati being one of the older ones, but then things like trending articles. Um, this was uh, last night for me, apparently on Facebook, on my phone, uh, Mark Zuckerberg's uh, wedding is a, is a trending article for me. So these are algorithmic determinations of stories that I should be paying attention to. Um, that are, that are done through an algorithmic process. On the flip side, we see this algorithmic making and, and uh, consuming of news. So some uh, folks at uh, Northwestern, a narrative science group that, uh, that grew out of there, did a, a, a neat project called Stats Monkey, where they actually said, you know, Little League game, games don't get reported on, really, but we've got all these stats out there. We've got all these, and baseball is this incredibly sort of formulaic and structured game that we can generate news stories pretty easily. So they actually are generating stories that look an awful lot like sports stories um, based on stats from Little League games. And again, you sort of think, wow, that's, that's great, because Little League games are you know, traditionally underreported. You're not necessarily going to have a bunch of reporters going out there and doing it. But we have this moment of relying upon data to generate these stories. And you have to ask about what does that interstitial, the intermediary layer, look like of how the algorithm is actually constructing narrative in the way, you know, think back to the my examples I gave of uh, you know, journalists' subtle use of irony or um, adverbial phrases to sort of do this very subtle framing and subtle distinction, where does that subtlety exist in an algorithmic uh, construction of news? It's not to say it's not there, but it's to say what kind of news are we creating in those systems? And then finally, this last one is Thompson, uh, news, uh, Thompson Reuters News Scope, where you can actually make investment decisions based on Thompson Reuters' uh, analysis of news stories of particular companies. So you can sort of hand over your portfolio and say, please go analyze the news, make buy sell decisions for me based on the news feed that Thompson Reuters is, is algorithmically processing. So again, it's this, uh, in almost a sense, there's no need for a reader in that case, right? There's no need for actually somebody to consume a story that's been produced. We can have algorithms talking directly to algorithms. Um, this is at University of Tokyo. Again, I'm going further, further, farther afield here. University of Tokyo had this uh, journalistic robot. This is a robot that was trained to actually go into a room, uh, build a visual image of that room, and then go in the next day or periodically afterwards and recognize what's new in the room and actually generate a news story based on what it encountered as new. 
It's a very narrow version of what news means in terms of sort of difference and timeliness. But again, it's this notion of algorithmically implanting a notion of news value into uh, a story. And then drone journalism, and there's some really nice folks at University of Nebraska that are doing some work on this to say, this is sort of a big data generation problem for new, or news organizations to say, now, instead of going out and trying to get access to a bunch of uh, news feeds and news sites, maybe we as news uh, organizations or news professionals can actually generate our own data, but it raises this question of what we do with all that data. So what I want to argue is that all of those sites, all of those places, and I, don't know, I went through them kind of quickly, but what I wanted to do is give you a, um, a wide sort of view. These are things that I'm calling newsware, in a sense. And the reason I sort of introduced this term newsware is to say, I think we need some sort of structured approach to understanding or to viewing what press freedom might be in all of these socio-technical spaces. So it's not just looking at code, it's not just looking at what journalists are producing now, but it's looking at this middle ground, this confluence of journalists and technologies working together. And I, I import here from, for people who study science, technology, and society studies, this notion of infrastructure. And infrastructure sounds like sort of a, a boring word, but I think what's really great about this as a, as a theoretical framework is infrastructure is all this stuff that's kind of invisible in the world. It's stuff that we don't see, it's stuff that we use and encounter every day, but we don't think about where this infrastructure comes from. We often don't notice it until it breaks down. Um, one person's infrastructure is another person's application. If you, if you talk to somebody who works for a railroad, that railroad line is not just you know invisible infrastructure that you you ride upon as you're on a train but that is the end goal that's that person's job to maintain that and to do it and what i want to argue here is in news where the reason i think infrastructure is a good analogy or a good metaphor to use is that we can enter into this conversation at many points along the way we can enter into it from you know the drone journalists we can ask how that data is gathered but we can also enter into it from a news story process and say you know where was that notion of of irony or, or uh, journalistic interpretation in the algorithmic construction of news um so this is largely what I already said, but conceptually, these are these sort of shared and embedded, but largely invisible kinds of logics that I think are structuring these relationships between presses and publics. And when I, you know, make this move then to say, well, operate, like, what is it that you're actually studying then? Like, this is sort of a, an abstract notion of what newsware might be, but this is the moment then to look at sort of the algorithms, the interfaces, the practices, capital flows, how advertising revenue flows, and ask at each step along the way, um, where this idea of a right to hear or whether a freedom to hear exists in this confluence of, of technology. Um, so I think I'm just going to skip because I already said that. So I want to shift now the last, the last bit of this is a study that I did of one particular piece of newsware. So if I've given you this sort of overview of what I mean by press freedom and I've asked you to sort of buy onto my um, sort of you know, quasi-socialist view of us depending upon each other for freedom, um, I'm Canadian, by the way, I should admit that uh, in the moment. So um, I've asked you to sort of buy into that, that notion of that philosophy of freedom. And I've given you a little history of where press freedom has been worked out and how this isn't really that new a problem. And then giving you a little bit of a run through of these places that we see it being worked out in network technology today. What I want to do now is just dive a little deeper into one particular kind of newsware. And it's one that's... Um, a little bit understudied these days, but that's, it's a notion of an uh, application programming interface or an API. And this is something that's kind of new that news organizations are doing as they're starting to create application programming interfaces or APIs into their systems. So for those in the room or those in the crowd who you know, haven't heard of what an API is or don't really know what I mean by an application programming interface, I think there's actually, for me anyway, sort of a, a relatively straightforward way of thinking about this. So I want you to pause for a second and think about your experiences at the post office. Because what I want to argue is that the post office is a kind of API, right? I go into the post office and I, if I put a stamp on an envelope, if I address it the right way, if I put you know, the to in the center and the from and either on the back or in the top left corner, and I know that I do it and I plan ahead maybe a couple days, although given post office, um, the US post office uh, interactions lately, I hope this doesn't become a historical example for the post office. But I know how to behave in relation to the post office, right? I know how to behave in order to get something done. I can get my letter across the country or across the world as long as I know how to follow the rules of the post office. What I don't need to know is how the post office works, right? I don't need to delve into the details of how that letter is actually read, whether the uh, stamp is read to be the correct amount of postage or not. I don't need to do that. The post office is this way that we've all learned to interact with um, and uh, 
this is this notion for, again, for the programmers in the world, the idea of the application programming interface is sort of a tablecloth. It conceals complexity. It's something that says, I don't want to invite you into the, the guts and the details of my system, but I'm going to help you figure out how to relate to a system. So this is what news organizations are starting to do. And you should think about this in relation to some of the stuff I said earlier about how the press distances itself from publics, but also relies upon publics at the same time. So this idea that freedom is something that sort of it requires dependency, but it also requires separation. This is the press struggling with, with an identity in a moment. This is an identity crisis. The API is one place to see it. So what the API is, in a news organization sense, is it's, it's kind of a software toolkit. So you can go to, um, well, this is actually what it is. It's a system of rules and associations. It's this software toolkit that lets you actually use news organization data in a way that you wouldn't have used that before. And this is for programmers mostly, although there's some inroads to letting non-programmers or people without technical abilities use it. But these are sort of the rules and associations by which news organizations let you into their content. So I did a study of three different news organizations' APIs. This is The Guardian, The NPR, and The New York Times. And these are sort of three leading. USA Today also has one. Um, Mashri uh, has a, a whole set of APIs that it actually uses. But these are sort of the three leading API, news organizations that had APIs. And what you do with these APIs is you basically, as a programmer, you say, you have a bunch of data within your news organization. I want to build an app with that data. I want to rely upon it. I want to repackage it. I want to visualize it in some way. I want to actually make something new with that data. We have a few different examples here. Uh, this is one built with The Guardian that actually, The Guardian has a whole bunch of data on uh, where nuclear warheads are pointed in the world. And actually, you can so put in your uh, city and country and see the number of nuclear warheads that are pointed at you. <laughs> if you want to do that, that's, that's kind of a thing. Um, NPR had a really nice one. No, Reverbiage has a really nice one where it actually takes NPR uh, headlines and pays attention to the metadata and then replots it on a globe of the world and you can actually see sort of more of a geospatial sense of where stories are coming from and what stories are about. So this, it's, again, it's a different way of taking a news feed that NPR is providing and letting you create a different view on that news feed. Um, and then similarly, this is the New York Times had a, a public financing API where it actually tracked uh, where electoral campaign uh, contributions were coming from in the country and then uh, plotted them according to Republican and Democrat and was able to let, this was an app that was uh, letting you see where money was coming from and going to. Um, again, a very, these are all sort of very simple examples, but it's a case where the news organizations, through their APIs, they're making this toolkit and saying, here's a bunch of hooks and levies that you can, levers that you can use uh, to access our data. You can make something new with it. So what I did was I, I personally built um, one app with, uh, with the NPR API, but I experimented with all three of the apps. Um, did an analysis of, of several hundred public documents and speeches and um, stories about the apps. Um, and then did a review of, of systems that were built with these apps. And what I, again, my goal here was to read, again, go back to this word infrastructure for a second, was to read these infrastructures and say, where is press freedom being worked out in this infrastructure? This API is a place where the press is distinguishing itself from other people. So I did this one task here, which was um, with the NPR API, I said, all I want to do, I want to pick a two-week period. This is at the end of September, beginning of October of the previous year, and I want to build a news feed of NPR's healthcare coverage. That's all I want to do. I just want to, you know, something that I could put on my site that I could say, here was, you know, two week period of what NPR healthcare coverage meant. Let me do this to sort of experiment with what this looks like, me as, as programmer public. I have some programming skills. I'm not the best programmer in the world at all. And I also made a purposeful decision to try to use the publicly available, uh, there's an interface where you can actually, it's just checkboxes and you can build a query of an API uh, based on clicking some checkboxes. It's not a very heavy programming activity. If that didn't make any sense, don't, don't worry about it. Um, but what I want to do is I, I had this goal, right? This goal is to start to use this to figure out what it was like. The first thing I did was actually just uh, build a query based on healthcare and the US. These are just two keywords I did to search healthcare in the US. Um, Again, the details of those boxes do not matter, but they're just showing the, out, the output of what I, what I found. I found that I actually got too few results. I actually only got eight results from this. This is a two-week period. This was the height of a healthcare debate in this country. Um, and I got eight results from searching on healthcare and the US. Um, seemed kind of strange. So what I did was I ended up taking out the US because you know, I thought I'd broaden the, the search a little bit and find out. What I ended up getting was that um, 
a lot of the stories that resulted out of this had a US focus to them, but I actually lost some of the stories that I'd had in the first query. So there was this weird sort of uh, finding or this weird result where it seemed like stories were being sort of metadata indexed uh, partly through uh, US metadata, partly through healthcare data, but there was this strange, I would have expected you know, to get more results, but not radically different results um, from what I did. So the next step was actually to say, well, I wanted to actually understand this category of healthcare um, and the US because it seemed like that was the difference between step one and step two was there's something about indexing uh, US healthcare stories that's different. So I, I combined it with the world instead and to sort of say, well, maybe NPR is organizing its stories in this way that they're indexing them uh, through international coverage more than US coverage. I'm not sure. I got one story returned in that time over a two week period. And it was a story about uh, the US was found to have inflicted uh, syphilis in, on Guatemalans in the 1940s. It was, I was really in two weeks, this was the only thing that I got. It was a very sort of strange result. And, and it was actually inconsistent with the previous results. So I then actually discovered there's this other category called world health, which is somehow different from healthcare plus world and ended up only getting three stories. This is still not getting me in my, my goal here of making, a, making a, a news feed. I then also discovered that you can actually split it up by world and health, which is somehow different from world health as a key word. Got a completely different set of stories then that were not related. So, you know, these stories were not related to these stories at all. Um, and at that point I stopped because I really was discovering that there was this real challenge in trying to use the API. So again, you have to understand here, the NPR is actually opening up its whole data source to you and it says you can build a tool, you can do whatever you want with it. Um, but the actual act of building this app was a, a, an incredibly sort of complex ontological one. Yeah. If I went through the steps you just went through, my conclusion would be that their API was very buggy or that NPR didn't understand Boolean operations. Well, uh, <laughs> so keep that point actually. So findings, great. Um, inconsistent category interactions, great. Good point. So we have these, again, so me as news programmer now trying to interact with news system, right? This is this, this new moment of, of press public relationships. We have some inconsistent category interactions going on between world health, healthcare, world health, US. Can't recreate something that makes sense at least to me. And uh, to your point exactly, um, what I wanted as an ideal here, so Boolean logic wasn't built into the system. For, for programmers, it's not a big deal. You can rebuild the Boolean logic. It's, it's not a huge deal to do with the data source, but it wasn't available through the, the public tool that supposedly anybody can go and, and use and interact with. Well, you said this and that, that wasn't being really really interpreted as a Boolean and. No, no. Or, right. or whatever. Yeah. Right. So there's something here, and this is this led to this last conclusion, is that I as member of public trying to interact with this system, I kind of reached this, what I was calling an ontological black box. I was kind of reaching this moment where I actually couldn't look inside the categories that NPR was using to create its news stories. And I couldn't, I couldn't ask questions, I couldn't debate them, I couldn't say, I think I want to relabel it like this, or I think that I want to actually do some hand editing. It was a difficult API to work with. And I, I do not fault NPR for this at all, because I think this is actually an incredibly challenging moment to actually take internally uh, consistent logics that, you know, people have a tacit understanding of how to work with over years of being employees there and figuring out how to work with metadata. The New York Times has had a department since the late 1800s exactly on dealing with metadata in their news stories. So this is a, this is a long-standing problem in news organizations. But I, I use it to point out this idea that um, if you are a you know, citizen programmer, uh, member of a programming public trying to do this, you're going to run into some real, uh, I would argue, sort of ideological moments where the press is going to say, no, that's our job to manage the metadata. It's not your job. It's our, this is a moment we're going to do the description. You can do the repackaging. So what I ended up finding was there's these moments, and I, I, in the interest of time, I want to um, uh, just uh, blow through these and, and not, not linger on them. But so this, ex not just this experiment, this is sort of one example of, of one that I did, but looking over across all the documents and across the other experiments that I did, what I found was there are actually three different ways, I would argue, that news organizations are uh, mediating or regulating these press-public interactions. There's three ways that the press is distancing itself today from publics. 
and we can look at each one of these places to see whether or not we think our ideal of oppressed freedom or freedom to hear is being instantiated. So the one is just this idea of regulation. So this is uh, tiered levels of access, for instance. So uh, the Guardian's API, actually, you can get different levels of access to it depending on whether you want to pay um, pay the Guardian directly to use it, whether you want to let the Guardian put ads uh, on the site that you might create with the API, um, and what kinds of ads that you're willing to accept on the, on the site. So this is not sort of a, an open, um, completely equitable use of the API. We have a, a, a moment of differentiation here where if you pay, you get a different experience with the API. That's a decision that the Guardian's made. NPR, for instance, doesn't do that. So that, this is, again, a differentiation moment. Um, limits on revenue generation. This is actually just this moment where um, if you put ads on your site, for instance, with The Guardian, you have to engage in this revenue sharing uh, arrangement with The Guardian. Because, again, one of the ideas is news organizations want to drive traffic back to their sites, right? This is, totally makes sense that they would offer APIs to let people build apps with them. But the tacit deal that you're making is that you're also going to engage in some kind of revenue sharing based on the traffic that's being driven back to the news organization's sites. Um, and the, the last one we see is this idea of there's a prohibition on archiving. So you have to go back to the API. It's, it's different in different systems, but uh, once a day to actually get new copies of the story. So again, this should be another little moment where we say, so me as citizen programmer, um, I don't actually get to say, I think maybe this story is done on my news feed. I don't get to say I want to archive this story, do a comparison between this story and the story that came after it. I'm contractually obligated to go back to the news organization and refresh my story constantly. And again, I get why news organizations would do this, right? It's, it can be really messy to have multiple versions of a story floating around, but this is a moment where um, the press is again asserting itself. It's sort of saying, no, we're going to keep track of what the version of the story is in this moment. Um, that's not for you to do. You can republish for us. Again, it makes sense, but it's, if we want to ask this question about what press freedom means, that's where it is. Um, second, this idea of architecture. So if the first one is regulation, sort of the terms of service and the kinds of agreements that you enter into when you use these APIs. The second is sort of the code as regulator. Um, so for people following Professor Lessig's work, this should be really familiar, this idea that the code is doing architectural work. It's regulating the kind of access. Um, and the one, you know, it's a, it's a rather simple point, is this idea of key control and personal information. So when I use an API, I have to release a certain amount of personal information. I'm issued a code or a key. That key is my access into the API. At any point, my access can be revoked through the key if I'm breaking terms of service or I'm doing something that's not, you know, not, not good or not open. Um, it's a, it's a moment where the code can actually be, be a regulator. And again, this should raise a little bit of flags here when we think about who owns the stories that are produced by a news organization. You know, think back to the idea that there's, at least in theory or ideal, there's, there's a notion of a constitutional protection here for the news that's generated. Um, here's a moment where a news organization can say, well, we're going to let you have it under some circumstances, but we're going to revoke that access if you're not uh, following the terms of service. Um, the architecture point here, this internal indexing and vetting systems, um, this should raise flags with the NPR one. So basically there's a whole bunch of ways that news organizations are generating and organizing stories that are not accessible to you as programmer. Um, finally, this idea of APIs organized into beats. Remember one of the points that I had, these historical things where you know, news organiza organizations you know, have real estate sections and automobile sections and house sections, but uh, no labor section or you know, often no environmental section. So we see this recreation of those logics in the organization of the APIs. It's, it's up, up to you to use the, the keywords to, uh, to recreate your beats if you want to, but the news organization is not going to do that for you. And finally, um, this idea of community, I think, is this last one. So what I also did was I, I attended and then um, did analysis of several of the different hack days and different kinds of places where API programmers are coming together with news organizations to create new systems. So the New York Times runs one, Guardian runs one, um, NPR has done some smaller ones at sort of a local level. But these hack days where you actually get together and you work with other programmers and you make something new with the APIs. And what ended up happening there a lot of times was, so even though we have these regulations and these architectures, um, the reason I say this idea of personal and informal relationships can circumvent regulations, tons of examples of people uh, at the news organization saying, I know you're only supposed to access this thing, like you're only supposed to make 5,000 calls a day to an API. You're only supposed to you know, trade, trade data with it 5,000 times. And you're supposed to go back and you're supposed to 
refresh the story once a day and you're supposed to do this revenue generating thing and you're supposed to put these ads on here. A lot of that is there, um, true, but if you're doing something that's really, really cool, that's driving a lot of traffic to our site, we'll talk. You know, and there's this sort of this moment where some of these, these rules and regulations, and again, totally makes sense. These are humans, these are people who are sort of trying to create some system that has economic uh, robustness to it. I get why it's happening. But again, as member of programming public, you, know, you need to understand that simply accessing the APIs is not giving you the same sort of uh, exposure to it, the exemption that you might get if you get to know the guy who runs the New York Times API really well, who's just gonna sort of you know, nod and wink and you know, look the other way if you're doing something that breaks the terms of service, but that's really cool. Um, so that's this moment. And so finally, the, one of the sort of key findings from this work is this, I think, this emergence of programming publics. So these are people, and think about theories of public sphere and theories of publicness from uh, people like John Dewey who talk about the public as this shared set of constituents. So we all come together and we all need to, we all have to experience the same thing. We can't separate ourselves out from public goods. I'd argue that actually we're seeing some programming publics emerge. These are people who are creating the conditions under which we're experiencing news. And I think these are a different set of actors than just the news organizations and just the social media companies. This is a set of hackers and a set of, uh, I mean hackers in a good MIT way, but if they, okay, okay. Um, um, good in MIT, yeah. Um, yeah, um, but I mean that as a sense that these are people who are actually creating the conditions under which you're ex experiencing news. This, I think, is a new place and an important place to look at press freedom. This is a place to look at and say, what are these people's conceptions of a public right to hear versus an individual right to speak? What are these people's conceptions of what constitutes hearing diverse information in a timely fashion? These are a lot of programming types decisions that get made, um, but that I think have not been scrutinized uh, in terms of sort of a, a journalistic, uh, almost a civil rights value. So I think I wanna end here. Um, I think this is what I've been trying to do in this project is one, just provide this definition of network press freedom to say that press freedom isn't this thing that li lives in any one news organization that we can point to necessarily. It's not a singular solitary profession that's responsible for press freedom. If the press itself is distributed and is existing in all these different kinds of places, then the notion of press freedom is also distributed and existing in multiple places. And the challenge is to sort of trace an idea of press freedom among this really complex changing ecosystem and figure out when do we encounter a free press? We, we can't just look to a news organization to find it, we have to look to this, this ecosystem. Um, and so the, yeah, I'll, I'll just skip to the end. I say. There's been a lot of debates around this issue of, you know, some of these old tired debates around, you know, is a blogger a journalist, is a blogger not a journalist? And I think that some of those things are, you know, boring and not terribly interesting to engage with. What I would argue is actually, you know, bumping it up a little bit in terms of abstraction and saying, when do we encounter a press that we want? When do we encounter the press that exists with the normative ideals or the values or the ethics that we expect from a democratic press? Questions of whether a blogger is a journalist or not kind of go away then because we don't worry about it. We say, if we want to accept my notion of democratic freedom as this thing that means freedom from and freedom to, if there's this positive notion to it, then we can, I think, look across the press and say, if it's enabling this public right to hear, if it's enabling a kind of listening that we can't do as individuals, then maybe we don't worry about whether somebody's a blogger or a journalist, but we worry about their role or their activity within this news ecosystem. So I'll stop there because I think we'll then have 15, 20 minutes for questions. Thank you. And I'm going to sit down because I've been talking. Um. Uh, sorry, yeah, I, um, I think I saw your hand first, but I'll, I'll go around and get the others after. Okay. Just on the question of um, APIs and uh, searching, uh, searching is very difficult, has a lot to do with taxonomy, it's a very complicated thing, so I'm not surprised that even a sophisticated news organization would have trouble turning up things that you search for, where I've had trouble with the Boston Globe in the same sure. way, but there are some systems that do very sophisticated natural language processing, Wolfram, uh, Wolfram Alpha, which underlies right. Siri, and uh, IBM Watson, which we all know from Jeopardy. And these things are actually quite opaque. They're proprietary. And even if they were opened up, most of us could not understand the algorithms. So I just want to throw that out to you as a. Yeah, I think it's a good point in that um, 
so the Guardian especially has been moving, because um, yeah, another thing I didn't really talk about was the the proprietary or open source nature of the software that these news organizations are relying upon to build their infrastructures. So sometimes you're right, it is these proprietary systems, um, but other times, and the Guardian I think has done a good job of this, of making a concerted decision to try to use more uh, and move to an exclusively open source infrastructure. Partly it is this ideological decision where they're saying we're a news organization who's trying to be open in both um, not just what we publish but also how we build. So I, I think it's a good critique to make um, of these systems is that. I think I saw your hand first and then um, um, I, I thought this was a fascinating talk, and it's a, it's a very interesting framework to think about a whole host of issues. Uh, oh, I, this was a fascinating talk, and I mean, a framework to think about a whole host of issues. Um, one thing I, I sort of kept thinking about, you know, as, as you explained sort of the network infrastructure, um, was WikiLeaks, which is sort of, you know, are bloggers journalists? Were WikiLeaks journalists? And let, let, let's presume they are. I mean, they ran they ran into a whole other set of tensions, which you didn't really explore. You know, their hosting service deciding they were politically incorrect, um, their payment processor deciding they were politically incorrect, etc. cetera. Um, do you have any thoughts on that? Yeah, no, I think Wiki, I've, I've written a little bit on WikiLeaks in other uh, contexts, but I think it is, uh, it's an example of, a moment where, it, for me, it depends on what you what you want to mean by a free press, right? So, so instead of me taking a stance on saying, you know, WikiLeaks was, you know, X or not X, I actually see it as a great moment where we saw coming to the surface a whole bunch of different conceptions of what press values are. So, and I think for me that was the real value of WikiLeaks is it's this moment where we get to debate uh, what is privileged information, who gets access to privileged information. Um, what is the gatekeeping look like on that? What are the, the background reliances on, you know, whether it's the credit card companies or whether it's hosting services, such that those are the conditions under which news is made. And for each one of those organizations, they're kind of getting sucked into this, um, I think nicely sucked into this uh, problem of what do you mean by a free press? And I, for me, that was the value of WikiLeaks was to say, we just made that conversation a lot more complicated and that's, wonderful, that's great. Because it actually brought to the surface a lot of dependencies, a lot of infrastructures. That's why I use the word infrastructure is it's that invisible stuff that we don't get to see. So a WikiLeaks moment is a moment of, of seeing it, um, which is great. Yeah. Um, I, sorry, I think the gentleman with the beard was next. And then I'm going to try to remember, but also please jump in if I've forgotten. Three data points which may have nothing to do with what you're talking about. Um, Marcy Wheeler reported on a press conference. I believe with the president, but maybe with uh, a national security advisor or someone like that. Okay. Basically, so say, can you speak up a little bit. Okay. Basically, saying that, oh, we don't need to uh, take take uh, reporters to grand juries to find out their sources. We already monitor all electronic communications and phones, oh. and and we already know that information. We're storing that at the NSA. Right. You know. So that's one. Yeah. This, the second is um, what's, hap what's happened in Chicago over the weekend, where you have people like Tim Pool, who's been a live streaming um, Occupy stuff with two, uh, two uh, cohorts, also citizen journalists, being stopped without warrants by the police and held at gunpoint and interrogated at gunpoint even though they knew that they, these guys were journalists or these people right. were journalists. And the third is uh, a recent move within the Congress, I guess within a defense authorization bill, to say let's take away the prohibitions against using propaganda on the public, the United right. States public. Right. So here you have three sort of forces of the state coming in, you know, and it's getting rid of all that freedom from, mm -hmm. basically. Yeah. Yeah. So I, no, I think it's a really great example of how it is more complex, and that's why I, I don't, I'd never want to argue, uh, argue that we don't need the freedom from right. part of this at all. I, I, I absolutely keep those um, 
together and and hold them up together. So I, I agree with you. How do you how do you see that dealing with the freedom too? The stuff that you've been discussing here. Uh, in those cases, exactly. You mean, well, not necessarily exactly, but those oh. trends. Yeah, yeah. So, I mean, one I think is this idea of again I put it to a sort of a structural question. So we sort of say it's not about in any particular moment. Um, making a, a decision based on a, a freedom too, but it might be something like, um, you know, if, if we're able to, so for instance, there's a series of Supreme Court decisions that actually, you know, took away the fairness doctrine, the right to reply thing, because it said, um, technologically, this doesn't really matter much anymore, because it used to be when spectrum allocation was, was limited, and you can only, then there was a reason, there was a logic for uh, having a right of reply, but there was a series of cases that said, um, for instance, in the uh, cable industry, there was a judgment that said, well, cable is this sort of infinite thing, so there's no technological rationale for uh, why we might have a right to reply there. Um, so we saw justices sort of doing it. Um, we only saw Justice Kennedy who actually said, well, but there if there's an economic monopoly that's created, then maybe that's a scarcity issue, so we might want to regulate that because um, even though it's technologically endless, um, Maybe there's a market issue, and I would. So I, the way I would add to this actually is more of an attention-based um, one. So I think, I think attention is actually sort of this scarce resource that um, hasn't made its way into a lot of these structural conversations for freedom too. So on a really sort of you know basic level, um, if you know as those stats are showing, if we're increasingly going to start encountering a lot of our news through what friends and family show us on Facebook, for instance, if that's if that's a major side if, if we start to see that happening. Um, I think there could be a case to sort of make some structural changes to what kinds of information I attend to or don't attend to. And maybe maybe it's a design decision to say, you know, you've kind of been paying attention to these people an awful lot. Here's a, a moment where I'm going inter to interact or interject as, as Facebook or as Twitter or, or somebody else in a journalistic-like way and say, um, we're going to give you something different than what you had 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 before. Um, I, I don't know. I don't think that really answers your question. I'm sorry, but it's um, that's how. Questions not answered. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Those are the best kind to try to answer. Then. Yeah. I I think there was one more here, and then and then you were there. Yeah. Yeah. Going back to the history, public relations is not journalism, but journalism is public relations. Correct. Uh, I wouldn't. I would say it depends. <laughs> well, the, so, the public, the president of the public relations firm that I worked for. You know, 11 years ago, would, that's what he would say. Okay. So the real question is like, what is the relationship now? Because I, mean, I know that it's you know it's rock solid in some places and mm -hmm. rock solid at certain times. Yeah. And with the growth of growth of interest in business and finance reporting, that was a big you know, and as well as tech, I, I did call it, it's called that. Right. Uh, was a big you know boon for public relations people. Right. What is the re in this? Milu, what is yeah. the what is what is the what is the what do the relationships look like, or is it all behind curtains? Yeah, it's a good question. I I honestly I haven't thought a ton about PR in the sense. I mean, I, the most experience I have with studying PR is mostly in this historical sense, where right. um, one of the reasons, for instance, is a you know, one of the reasons the Columbia Journalism Program was uh, was founded was this desire to distinguish journalists from public relations officials, and that was the or professionals, and that was this moment that was that was made. There was another moment in history when uh, opinion polling was sort of this increasingly used thing, where uh, opinion polls were coming from both market research organizations and political opinion polling organizations, right, and yeah, and there's a sometimes there's a de desire to distinguish between those different types of polling and on part of journalists to report on those polling uh, differently because one um, but I, I don't I don't have a lot of great insights into contemporary public relations stuff but my I would again sort of put it through this framework of not to take a stance to say public relations people you know are or are not journalists but to say it it probably depends in a particular moment of what's driving their Production or what's driving their their participation I have an in it. But it, has a, it has definitely had an effect over the behavior of journalists. Yeah, I probably right. For good or bad. Yeah, yeah, you're probably right. Uh, yes, at the end. Um, so I have a couple questions, which sort of tie in together. So first of all, it sounds like you had not just a, a question, not of open data, but open metadata question of how to, so have you considered using uh, sort of third party apps like semantic tools, like say Calais, Open Calais, for for journalism in order to uh, 
more, more meaningfully categorize these stories? Yeah, sure. So, I mean, in this case, though, I was relying upon the <coughs> metadata of the news organizations. So, I, I, I think that would almost be more of a question for them to say, how are they internally generating the metadata that is then used to describe the stories? Um, but I think that would be, you know, that would be an interesting move for them to make. But it also then is this reliance on another piece of software, another piece of technology that's doing some of that logical work as well. So I, I would want to see more about how those pieces of software are making decisions around metadata. And I, my hunch is that news organizations are not going to want to sort of completely give over their metadata uh, generation and maintenance. I know so the New York, New York Times has this you know, incredibly complex set of heuristics and set of rules around metadata. Uh, NPR has this ingest system, which is doing this really complex work of trying to make sense of what uh, member stations are sending it. So uh, if you go to NPR.org, um, some of those stories are coming from you know, WBUR, or KQED. There's sort of a lot of this data is flowing in, and there's this thing called the ingest system that's trying to make sense of all this data and trying to square up the metadata that's there. Um, and that, that depends highly on how different member organizations are doing it, and that's a, that's a hard piece of work. So I would, I would honestly doubt that they would be willing to sort of give that over, but I think it's, a, it's an interesting question to ask of them. Sure. Second question was um, whether you sort of feel like we talk about the freedom of the press, mm -hmm. not just freedom from, but freedom to, but also the freedom of the consumer. Mm -hmm. So something, so one thing I could sort of see worrying about is like when you try all these searches and you find wildly different results, that you're sort of getting maybe like force fed into stories that you may not necessarily want to read. If you want to, so it's sort of like question you do, does the consumer have a right for a meaningful search? Uh, or for meaningful uh, <laughs> for, for meaningful topics that they articles that they read and not being like you know sort of uh, pulled into something that they may not have been looking for. Totally, yeah. So I understand it. I think um, so. I think there's two things to tease apart there. One is the generation of the stories that appear in the search, and then the other is the logic driving the search or structuring the search. And I think that those are both places to ask around what. Uh, what consumer choice means. I think that this, so the, the sort of the philosophical theory that I presented, um, is a, there's a lot more detail about even the the illusion of consumer choice in a sense, or what it is that you may or may not want has also been rather conditioned and structured upon uh, what you've encountered previously. And so th this is why it's kind of a, it's a normative departure. It's to say there is a difference between the news you might need versus the news you might want. And that's why it's a it's a structural question. It's not about me, you know, preventing you from seeing something or giving you bad search results. It's actually about me having a different value that goes into both the construction of the stories and the structuring of the search that says I'm not it's not just about fulfilling your consumer desire. And I know that that's a really controversial sort of thing to say because you might be unhappy. I totally get that. But you might be. Um, yeah. Yes, I think you and then you. But I'm. Oh, wait, sorry, you already asked one. Yeah, actually, okay, so I sorry. Yeah. Oh, sorry. Yeah. So, um, kind of building on what he was saying, um, it feels like from the fairness doctrine and the right of reply, we sort of did a shift from uh, like government oversight of what the media's responsibility is to the public to uh, almost a commercial oversight where you see like in WikiLeaks where the ISP decides what goes out and what doesn't go out yeah. and so like the commercial role within a media presentation or availability has gone sort of from like a sing signal booster to a potential signal squasher mm -hmm. um, yeah. and so I'm wondering if, if you see like a potential for uh, another way that government could be involved going forward or if it would have to come from a totally different quarter. So you br you briefly talked about like attention as a scarce resource. And I don't think anyone really wants government mandated oh, no. attention. <laughs> no, no, no. So no. that would, you know, like yeah. it couldn't be the same kind of thing as like, you know, uh, AM, FM dial resources being right. allocated. But right. um, I'm wondering if maybe it's like a, like the best thing would to like more of an NGO kind of uh, um a role. Well, I think so. One place I'd look is there's a lot of um, so even tax law stuff around you know funding or not funding but um, calling news organizations as nonprofits. And there's sort of you know there's been in the last probably six months some really nice stories and documentation around how difficult it is sometimes for news organizations to get themselves classified as nonprofits. And and folks in the 
I'm sure you guys can talk a lot about that or what the challenges are around that. Um, so there's a case of, you know, through the tax code, there could be a government role for supporting journalism, but that's that's not, so there's a bunch of things to separate out here. There's not, I'm not talking about government having voice. So I'm not talking about um, creating a, you know, state news channel that sure, has to get your attention. That's not, not yeah, yeah. The They're okay. Right, yeah. So I think that it's, um, so it's not about giving government a voice, and there's, Owen Fiss has a really nice piece, actually, if anybody's interested, on um, different types of state roles that can be uh, in, a, um, in a media system. And the idea of government speaking is actually a sort of a small one. That's not really, a lot of it's about structural stuff yeah. in terms of, um, you know, tax code Anywhere might be larger, one. Or instead of, instead of it being Comcast, like, right. you know, as, as much as I may distrust government to be involved in detailed ways in certain ways, I trust Comcast less. Because I can't really outvote Comcast, even, you know, that's even more impossible than, right. you know, like I, I'm on the phone longer waiting for Comcast than I am for <laughs> my congressman. Yes, I can totally, yeah, I can so, totally see yeah, that. Yeah, it, it, yeah. It's more uh, arbiter, not as voice. Yeah, yeah, not as voice. I, I, I totally agree. And the other thing is the, um, I think one thing, you know, the, the state can do as well is sort of, um, provide a, either an investigative role or provide a, um, a role of orienting people to even the problem existing as well. So it's not necessarily that, you know, the state is going to fund some news organizations and not others um, yeah. or have a voice, but it's going to say maybe there's a problem here um, that could be addressed through through private markets, through civil society, through lots of different kinds of things. Yeah. Uh, sorry, one more. Okay. You guys, you both spoke before and you both have your hands up and I don't know what to do. Can we combine them? Can we combine them? I'm at not a question. Okay, then can we Mine hold? A question. Yours okay. is a question. Okay, let's do the question first and then the comment. It seems okay. like a, a proprietary API is only as good as the, orga the organization's willingness to support and ability to support it. Mm -hmm. When you encountered it, you know, when you were totally baffled by NPR's uh, idea of Boolean logic, was there anybody at the other end who could tell you, you know, what either what you were doing wrong or what they might have been doing wrong that was causing these problems? Yeah. So, um, so I. So the short answer is no, exactly. Uh, but there is a really nice sort of uh, user community of people who are trying to build with NPR, and this this is true for um, for the New York Times and for the Guardian as well. So one of the, but I think those user communities are are. They're doing really great work, but they're often sort of small, and you know this is relying on people's sort of volunteer labor to do all this all stuff. On, all on, on the user side of the black box. Um, yeah, but NPR is actually, I think, really good about. They're really good about saying they want to support this uh, infrastructure. I, so everything I'm saying is not a criticism of NPR because it's actually. I mean, what they're doing, I think, is really incredible with the small set of scarce resources and right, the, the people are doing it. Really baffling. It doesn't make sense to me. What yeah, I mean, I'm on a bunch of the here. mailing lists, and there are people yeah. who will chime in and, and yeah. help you out with that. So it's it's there, but it also requires you know some some way to ask that question. Yeah, so that's good. Sorry. Then yes. To the comment about the user's right to a you know, fair search, mm -hmm. I think it's interesting that Google has started to assert that the results of its search is protected speech in and of itself, that it represents, that you know, article. its its opinion about the various sources. Yeah, I mean, I saw that article. I think that's a really, <laughs> it's a really tricky notion of free speech. Anything. That, was that it's, you know, First Amendment right. right for them to assert their opinion yeah. that this is, you know, the most important site in the world about yeah. Google. Yeah. No, I think that's true. I'm getting a look from MR that I think we're, uh, we're running out of time. But thank you very much. Thanks.